uncertainty. This is called the uncertainty principle propounded by a young student in the Zurich Polytechnic in 1925. His name was Werner Heisenberg. So now I answer the question, what is science? Science is change. C-H-A-N-G-E. Okay? Science keeps changing. And if it doesn't change, it is not science. Unfortunately, same thing should have happened to religion. Because religion is also a science. It's also trying to find out the truth. And religion is also changing for thinking people. But for non-thinking people, religion is rigid. What is written in the book? No. Religion also changes if you look inside. Unfortunately, what has happened today? Science, in the conventional sense, people think science is knowledge. And that's what it was thought to be. That's why it's the name is derived from the original Greek word CA, which means knowledge. But knowledge is very simple. Knowledge is nothing. It's just noise. Now we know science is derived not from CA, but from the the Sanskrit root ski. Ski is cut into, cut into. So you go inside and find out, that's called science. Everything you try to find out how it works, that is science. Now no leaf fruit. Okay, you make a statement, no leaf is very good. Fine. You may be right, but I don't know. Now I try to find out if it is good, that's called scientific approach to no leaf. Do you get that now message? So that's what I want you people to do because you have done a wonderful thing. And I'm quite assured, I'm sold to the idea that Peter wants to say that noni is a very good plant and it has got a lot of good things for human beings and for their health. <laughs> Only three things make you sleep. One is milk, another is meat. Milk and meat products, if you have taken an egg in the morning for breakfast, you will sleep in the class. If you have taken coffee or tea with milk, you will sleep. If you have taken curds, you will sleep because in every one of these things there is a protein called levotryptophan, levorotatory tryptophan. And this amino acid cuts, shortens, light out sleep interval. You know this light out sleep interval? All of you are married? Yeah. Okay. Now when you go to bed, two of you go, go to bed now. I mean, you have one wife or one husband, two of you go to bed. Now, you put off the light, right? Now, one of you might start snoring within seconds. The other one might be rolling in bed for half an hour, one hour. This is called the light out sleep interval. Did you get that? Now, if you want to shorten that, the easiest method is to take some levotryptophan things. That's why our old granny used to say, when you go to bed, have a warm milk to drink. I am not subscribed to her idea now because science has changed. Now we know milk is poison. But she used to think milk is good. Milk is good provided it's human milk because we all are human beings. I was, I was uh, propagating the idea of a human milk bank for children whose mothers don't have milk. And there are mothers who have plenty of milk. In fact, I was so happy that this idea I was propagating on the internet. Recently somebody wrote to me, his wife produces so much milk that their child cannot uh, you know, uh, stomach all that milk. She is something, you know, she produces about two liters of extra milk every day. And now he has made a bag out of it. And in Switzerland, any child which doesn't have mother, he supplies that milk free. You know, this is a fascinating idea because science is learning from nature. You look at nature. No animal in nature, not in your house, your house, dog and cat, I'm not talking about. They're not animals. They are under captivity. No animal in nature drinks the milk of another species. How can man drink cow's milk? Now see the science behind it. Have you seen a cow's child when it's born? Have you? If you cages be blown, that depends on its size. The minute it falls down under the ground, it jumps up and walks. Your child? takes nine months to even sort of try to get up. It takes sometimes two years to walk. See the enzymes in this milk, which makes your child walk in two years, and enzyme in the cow's milk, which makes the cow's calf walk in one hour, or one five minutes, and you give that powerful milk pro enzyme to this child. This child will have a differential growth. And all this is starting from cancer. 
especially diabetes, the milk protein is a foreign protein. So the minute milk comes in, body says, ah, some foreigner has come, let me throw him out. So there will be antibodies produced against milk. These are, these are body's defense mechanisms. So it says, hey milk, you get lost. Don't harm my system. Now these antibodies look for any protein which has an identical structure. And the beta cells in the pancreas have an identical structure to cow's milk protein. So after hitting all the cow's milk, the remaining antibodies say, do I have any work anywhere else? They come to the pancreas and hit the beta cells. So by the time you are 30, 40, you become a diabetic. The more milk you drink from the cow, the quicker you become a diabetic. <coughs> now these antibodies are roaming around the place. They don't have any work. Supposing you have a lot of people in Chennai who have a gun in their hand and they roam about in Mount Road. After some time they are itching to shoot something, isn't it? They shoot at random. So there is a crossfire, any one of us can get caught. So in this crossfire, if your joint cells are caught, you get a joint disease called autoimmune joint disease. That is, your own body's antibodies are hitting your own body. There was a man called Paul Ehrlich who first thought of this antibody business. He is the father of antibody business. And he once said, he had a dream once, one night. <coughs> Supposing these antibodies hit our own body? So he propounded a hypothesis called horror autotoxicus. He said, my God, what will happen if these antibodies one day hit me? And that has come true today. He didn't know, Paul Ehrlich didn't know about autoimmune disease. Now you name it. Every other disease autoimmune, thyroid is autoimmune, gastritis is autoimmune, heart disease, autoimmune, kidney disease, autoimmune, joint disease, you name it. Autoimmune vasculitis, polyarthritis, not as a systemic sclerosis, lupus erythematosus, my God. Any number of them. All we invited, our forefathers in the forest had only two diseases. Old age, <coughs> the disease, process. They died of old age or predation. Either a snake bit them or a tiger ate them. No disease, because they never knew about disease. Today we are frightening the society with the disease. Have you got out of the Madras airport? There's a one thing. One in four Madras is, is a diabetic. Are you one? The minute you see that, you get the fear. The minute you get the fear, you go for a checkup, you are not to get up. You are labeled, labeled as a diabetic. Every young man has got a heart disease. It's coming to eat you up. The truth is, in 100 years, there's a nice study which took 100 years statistics in Europe where there are statistics available, like Europe, especially in England, the statistics from 1841, impeccable statistics. A man called William Stehabans, Stehabans W.J. is his name. And Stehabans did a study. The incidence of increase of coronary artery disease in the last 100 years, and it showed that there has not been even 1% increase in absolute coronary artery disease in 100 years. Can you believe that? All that we are talking about is relative increase. That is, the average life expectancy of people 50 years ago was 27 years. So you can't get a heart attack within 27 years. Now it is average in India is 69 years. So you certainly qualify for a heart attack. As you age, certain diseases come. Now you can say, lot of people have become white-haired in India today. Yes, because they, they died by before 27, how can they have white hair? They all had black hair. Today they are here 80, 90, so they must have white hair. There is nothing unusual about it. You can't say incidence of white hair has gone up. No. It is because people have lived longer, number one. Number two, coronary artery disease can be ideally diagnosed by patient's symptoms. Today we don't allow that. We go and angiogram a child in the school also. Some people did that. They post-mortem angiogram young boys in the American army who were shot dead in the Vietnam and Korean War. 100 soldiers from Korean War, 100 soldiers from Vietnam War. 18 to 20 years age. Young soldiers just joined. 18 years they joined the army. And they were angiogrammed post-mortem. 76% of them were free vessel block. Which means these vessel blocks are not a disease. They are just there as a part of your process which starts in the womb, ends in the grave. 
But today, we label it as a disease and say, oh, everybody is, everybody gets a bypass surgery, everybody gets an angioplasty, everybody gets, because it is 5 to 10 lakhs. So the essential message is, this world runs for money. And that has come to science. Science runs for money. We don't want that science. Ten years ago I wrote an article that stem cell research will come to naught. Not. You know what? Not. Because you can modify the cell outside the human body in any way you like. You have a laboratory you can do that. When once you put it inside the body, what it does depends on it and the body and the environment and not on you. You can send a moon voyage up and then monitor it from here and say, hey, go to the next orbit. You go to the next orbit. If it doesn't go, then you say, it's failed and all. Then billions of dollars to go down the drain. If it goes, then you say, oh, see, it has gone there. It's now sending pictures. So what? These pictures we have seen for donkey's ears. What's the big thing about it? 100,000 crores for those pictures. If you use one-tenth of that money, you can see that no Indian is starving. We are not worried about that. Now, very interesting. One of my students sent me a write-up yesterday from America. He said, sir, your 20 years ago prophecy has come true that most of the stem cell research was fake. Now, science is withdrawing its first paper on stem cell research. Nature has withdrawn its first paper on stem cell research last week. Both papers were fake because they changed the, the pictures in such a way that it looked like some modified cell and did wonderful things and they got millions of dollars and they got this, they got Nobel Prize and what have you. F-A-K-E. Do you want that kind of science? No. We want noni science. What is that? What is that? What is noni science? True science. And what is science? Searching for the truth. Searching for the truth. Truth will never be known. Remember that. Truth can never be known. But going in search of the truth is called science. Next slide please. I told you, what is religion? Going in search of truth. Only difference is, scientists do experiments in the laboratory and then say, I have proved it. And priests sit in the temple or the church or the mosque and say, I have proved it. He is there. He is sitting there. I can see. He said this, he said that, etc., etc. Both are telling stories, right? Yeah. Next slide. What is research? This is important. Now you must understand this very, very, very carefully. Research is simple curiosity. Simple curiosity. I just want to know how this jacket is made. I want to scientifically study this young man's, handsome young man's jacket making. That's science. Did you understand that? Yes. So how does the noni fruit to work? I want to know. That's called science. Science is not 2 plus 2 is 4. Or 8 into 2 is 16. No, that's not science. That's bullshit. Science is how do things multiply? I will find out. You know, our teaching is so wrong in school, you say A plus B whole squared, A squared, B squared, 2AB, no. You simply tell the student, give him a project, go and find out. And he will find out a better answer than what you have in the textbook. In short, teaching must be projecting. Just tell, tell the student. Instead of saying cow has four legs, tell the student, go home, study a cow and come and tell me how many legs the cow has. That is science. So I am telling you, go home and find out what noni is. That is called science. And that said, I must tell you now, if you want to sell noni in the world, then you have got to adhere to certain known scientific tenets put forward by conventional scientists, so called scientists, quote unquote. I am not saying they are wise men. They are to be wise men. They think they are wise men and they say, the certain rules must be followed. A. If you want to give a drug, a chemical, a plant to another human being, you shall first prove, P-R-O-V-E, that it is safe to give it to an animal, not in the conventional dose, hundred times, thousand times bigger dose. Now, if you do, 
studies some noni plant extract or noni plant as such whole plant on a mice give it a big dose supposing the mice needs 1 microgram you give 100 mg of the dose and then study the mice for a week for days e weeks and then months and then if you can keep the mice alive for 6 months or 1 year you get what they call as the acute subacute and chronic toxicity studies okay if you did that the west and the scientific world will accept noni as safe there is a conventional protocol i am not going into the the housekeeping details of that here all that i want to tell you is the first thing now we have got to do is do toxicity studies on the conventional western model of noni fruit is that clear now yes that said now i start to tell you how inadequate the science is i'll give you an example there was a drug which was put forward our vice chancellor will know it's called milrinone amrinone milrinone came into this world as huge big drugs they said no more people will die they know these wonderful drugs nobody dies of heart failure blah 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 the propaganda was so big that the so called fda which is supposed to be the headmaster of all these studies which must accept it and say okay fda approved companies will say fda approved fda is the biggest fraud under the sun is 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 appointed by the government in office in america and the government fellows have all the drug companies in their uh, payroll you must see that movie called sicko s i c k o all of you must see that there it shows the us congress okay when each one is walking in george bush walks in there's a label this fellow has taken 569 million dollars from this drug company this drug company and this drug company next fellow will walk in uh, who dick chaney will walk in this fellow has taken 1 billion from eight companies then hillary clinton will walk in this lady has taken so much money everything is there and fellows went against that producer in the court and he won these rascals had taken money and who, who appoints the fda director bush and who is the fda director first cousin of dick chaney and who is dick chaney the biggest of three companies he has 80% shares okay now milrinone was licensed for human use before any other human study was done only rat studies were done and it showed fantastic it no toxicity in the rat and the rat's heart failure got controlled very quickly and no rat died human study to the extent that doctors in india i am talking of the 1980s bombay and delhi and all used to prescribe milrinone to their rich patients and the fellow will say i must get this from america and one tablet used to be some 500 rupees and he says i am fine one day i was giving a talk in bombay 84 then i said this has not been studied in human beings at all how can you prescribe that they all laughed at me this fellow is from a village you know mangalore is a village he comes to bombay to tell us tell us what is they laughed at us very quickly a human study was started which is called promise study prospective randomized milrinone survival evaluation and within 6 months the study showed treated patients died 27% extra <laughs> <laughs> now the vice chancellor will tell you the drug was withdrawn but the problem is problem is that milrinone works as a smooth muscle dilator in a rat thereby it opens the vessels removes what is called the after load on the heart and you know coming to newton's laws determines the no no after load is removed so heart forms easier in the human being it works as a stimulant of the cyclooxygenase system cyclic amb in the heart muscle cell itself and the tying muscle is whipped the horse is almost tired it's lying down you go on whipping the horse the horse dies so all people die the moral of the story is mice is not man <laughs> so if you do noni studies on the mice i cannot swear and say noni is safe because in man you don't know you have to do man studies you understand that but for the western thing for acceptance of journals you can get your paper published in nature or science or american Med- medical journal by doing conventional protocol of mice studies 
How to do it? If you want, we can give you the protocol afterwards. That's the first one. Now, the most important thing is, when you have curiosity, I have curiosity. Now, supposing, let us say, I find a, a rounded thing lying there. Okay? I walk into this room. This is a five-star hotel, a rounded thing lying there. I am very scientific. I want to know what it is. So I go, open it, it happens to be a bomb, and I get blown, and this whole room gets blown. That is called skepticism. <coughs> you must know this this world can have a lot of unattended things, which you know, bombs left anywhere in the railway station, bus station, bus plane, anywhere. So I shall not meddle with it. If I see that, I must tell the police, and my science must be suppressed temporarily, and I must have what is called logical skepticism. So if you have curiosity, combined with the logical skepticism, you become a pakka scientist. Scientist doesn't mean you must go to and get a BSc degree, you know. The father of modern science, Sir Francis Bacon, was a lawyer. Did you know that? Sir Francis Bacon was the advocate general in King Charles the court. He was a good law student. Any law students here? Do you know what law students are? They are trained to see that people don't become, you know, get, you know, they are not allowed to live happily. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, if I, if I go and tell the lawyer, look, I have murdered Peter, now to save me, he'll say, how much will you give me? I'll give you a crore rupee. Don't worry, I will create such an evidence that Peter never lived here. <laughs> so, this is called jurisprudence. Did you understand that? That is why, Years ago, centuries ago, there was a king called King Ferdinand in France. At that time, Christopher Columbus found the new world. So a lot of people who didn't have enough bread to eat in, in Paris and France, they wanted to migrate to the new world. So there are a lot of uh, shiploads of people going. But Ferdinand made a law, which is there still in the, in the uh, statutes. He said, nobody who has studied jurisprudence shall go there. Because he said, let people be happy in the new world. So he got out. It was December. To be precise, it was December 14. He got out and found a lot of ice there on the sides. Because you know, a lot of snow was there, sleet was there. So he had an idea. He saw some dead um, uh, worms and all there, absolutely fresh. So this is called, see, this is curiosity. So he got out. He went to a house there, you know in those days like our slum houses in Chennai and all that small all these uh, slums said. He went in and told the lady, give me one of your fowls. Chicken was kept in the house only, like we used to do in our villages and we were all young. So he got the chicken, squeezed it and killed it, removed the giblets and stuffed all this ice into its uh, tummy and then stuffed it with ice, packed it nicely and then told the lady, keep it for a week and then eat it, it will be fresh. Lo and behold, the meat was fresh at the end of the week. That was the beginning of refrigeration. And he is called a scientist. But lo and behold, he was, he was punished for that by God, for all his sins. He got out, old man, and it was very cold. In those days there was no heating, so he caught a cold, which became a pneumonia, and he died before the chicken was eaten. <laughs> He is supposed to be the father of modern science, which is experimentation. He experimented with the ice to see that the chicken is kept. So none of you should feel in fear saying that, I have not studied science, how can I get involved in research? If Sir Francis Bacon who studied law could be, become a scientist and father of science, you are very highly qualified to be a scientist because you didn't study law. I am only happy that Ferdinand is not alive today. Supposing Ferdinand were to be alive today, and if people were going to the new world, he would have said, doctors and lawyers should not be included in the crowd. <laughs> because they will never make people happy wherever they go. Okay? So, these are the two things. So, remember that. Now, there's, there are two kinds of research. One is called observational research, which our ancestors did for thousands of years. I'll give you one example. Brahmins in my part of the world, when they eat in a banana leaf, they keep the leaf, then take a little water, the, they, they just take the water around. You know like Catholics say grace before they eat, 
stand be behind the chair. And if you, you know, if you are in Ireland, it is very religiously they do that. If you are eating, you know, I go there uh, for example, you know, they stand behind the chair and then they take, say what's called grace. Religious, they say they, these people also do that and then take that water and then eat. People say, oh, it's a superstition, bullshit, they start the shwellers. You know. No, I analyzed it, went back into it. There is a pipe which takes food from the mouth to the stomach. Did you know that's called the gullet or the esophagus in our language? No, we make uh, words very difficult because it's from Latin, that's all. Esophagus. There's a closed tube like that. It is potentially open but kept closed. Okay? Supposing you go and eat, let us say you take first one large piece of biryani in the mouth and swallow it. This may not open at all and you can get stuck there and behind that is the gullet and it may block that and you just don't breathe and die. This is called choking. And one of the army or the air force generals was eating after a heavy boost and his uh, gullet didn't open at all and he died on the spot. So, if you put a little water first, it opens and then it starts. In the wriggling movement, it's called peristalsis. See? So people must have observed over a year and year and see. People who ate large sum suddenly without any water, they died sometimes. But if this took one small sip of water before that, they never died. So they said, okay, we'll, uh, they asked everybody, you know, you all before you eat, take a little sip of water. What is the compliance? Hardly one person. Then they immediately brought fear. They said, God will be unhappy if you didn't do it. So God was invoked for better compliance, that's all. God was simply brought down from wherever he was or she was. And she said, God wants you to take this. That's it. So compliance went up. See, it's a very scientific observation. This is called observational research. That is why they were called Rishi, Rishi. They can see it again and again, Rishi. What do you and I do in the so-called Western science is research. How do we do? We take 100 people, divide them into two groups. One group takes water, the other group doesn't take water. One group takes water and meat, other group only swallows meat. And in this meat, he is swallowing fellow, 550 people die. Here nobody dies, so we come to a conclusion, eating with little water is very good. That's the conclusion and the paper gets published in nature. <laughs> but this is not reliable because if this happens in 100 people, if you took 10,000 people, it will be reversed. This happened in many studies. That is called confidence interval. That is, if you do a study, the study's number must be large enough statistically to be able to project that result onto the public. Do you understand that? which is there is a minimum of 2,000 people. You must study at least 2,000 people to have a confidence interval which is good enough to tell others. Rest of the studies are all statistical. Statistics is the biggest lie under the sun, so don't worry. But when you publish it, you apply statistics. There are rules very simple. It's a, it's a software is there, you put your things there and things will come out. Nothing very big. Don't bother your head about statistics. One of the biggest lies. Next slide. <coughs> Now this is the most important thing. All science in the West to date is reductionist. But the true science in the world is holistic. And this is very important for Noni because I don't want you to repeat your studies in reductionist science and then very soon realize if the studies are all wrong. I want you to go in de novo to holistic science. I'll tell you the difference. To make it very simple, I thought of this the other day. Because Every time I go and tell people the difference between reduction science and holistic science, they're totally confused. At the end of the day, they're confused confusion. So it's a very simple. Now, let's see. Next slide. Now, uh, that we'll come back to that. Next slide. Ah, what is this? What is that? Sweet chocolates. See, varieties of chocolates, assorted chocolates, right? Now, let us study, let us do research on chocolate. What is the effect of chocolate on the human body? How do we do? You can either feed the human body whole chocolate and study. That's the best way. We don't do that. What do we do? Next slide. Next slide. What is chocolate made out of? <coughs> Sugar. Next. Next. Cocoa. Next. Milk. Right? Now what we do is, we study sugar in great detail. 
and then say chocolate must be doing what sugar does. Then we study cocoa and say ah chocolate must be doing what cocoa does. Then we study milk and say milk chocolate must be doing what cocoa does. That's what you have been doing. You say what is the alkaloid in the naughty plant? What is the chemical there? I will study that. No, it doesn't do that. What is water? Hydrogen and oxygen, right? What does hydrogen do? It burns the whole place. Most the most volatile substance in this world is hydrogen. And what does oxygen do? It abets volatility. Now what does this do? Set fire to this? Does it burn? So water is not hydrogen. Water is not oxygen. So how can you say water is what hydrogen is and what water is oxygen is? Did you get the difference? Yes. So if you want to know what water is, <laughs> you must drink water and see. I can't drink hydrogen and say, ah, now I know what water is. <laughs> and I can't drink oxygen and say, ah, I know what water is. That's what we are doing in research. And we have come to grief because every study has gone wrong. Because we have reduced it to bits. <laughs>